Hello everyone to Forest Focus. We're halfway through the last international break of the season. It's not even Forest prepared to face Crystal Palace in the Premier League at the weekend. We'll touch on that game and a lot more with topics including transfer interest in Murillo and Morgan Gibbs-White, an injury fear for Willie Bolly, Chris Wood's fitness and players who shone in this international break in the company of, first of all, Reds fan Greg Mitchell. Greg, how are you doing? Good, yeah. Busy day. If it's a bit noisy outside, a neighbour's having his patio done, so uh, I'll keep muting myself, but it seems all right at the minute. Power washed. No, he's having it. Doing his forest fan. Charlie Brown's doing it. He's cracking, lad. Goes forest oh, okay. home and away. But uh yeah, I'll keep muting myself. <laughs> That's fine. Those power washing videos I find quite addictive if they pop up in your Facebook feed or anything like that. Just be what a, what a power washing. What a start. What a life, I know. <laughs> Michael Temple, say something more interesting. How are you? Well, I know it's been a quite a few days for Forest, but you two talking about domestic boredom is uh even me and lewis are going to turn off in a minute but i think the what what did land with me last international break of the season i don't think i particularly enjoyed watching international football over the course of this weekend so looking forward to the return of the premier league because it's an excuse for us all to get our babysitters sorted out and not be hanging around pizza express like i was on saturday with zero interest in the in the three o'clock kickoffs so so yeah let's get back to the club action I have not watched any international football apart from Rayner and uh, Williams' goals, which we'll come on to, no doubt. Uh, third guest today is former Redmond fielder Lewis McGugan. Lewis, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Good, good, good to have you with us as ever. So, um, kick us off, Lewis. We're playing this phase of games now. Palace, Fulham, Wolves, three of the next uh, four games. And then I think it's Spurs away being the other one. When you look at the fixtures Luton have got in that time, some really tough ones. Uh, I think Everton have got some interesting games as well. Does this feel like it's kind of now or never for Forest, where you've really got to go and see if we're going to stay up or not? Yeah, I think it's a really important period coming up, uh, especially with the results and with everything off the back of uh, the points deduction and, and where we kind of see ourselves kind of landing at this point in time in the league. We look at our fixtures compared to uh, Luton's fixtures and and on paper, uh, we'd, we'd 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 definitely like to be in our position rather than theirs. But I think it's a it, it's an important uh, few weeks. I think the Palace game get a good result there. I think that will that will start hopefully a, a really solid foundation to to hopefully get it kind of put to bed uh, as early as possible. Really. What about you, Greg? Would you rather they were? At- uh, against on paper more tricky fixtures because we seem to do better. We've said this all season. We seem to do better against Newcastle, Man United, those kind of teams that are just below the elite rather than the ones around us. Is that something you're worried about or not? No, I, I mean on paper, is it we've only beaten one of the bottom ten, which isn't great. But given the position we are, I'd rather fight against the ones we're we're in and around, and certainly that home. That home run of three games now are absolutely crucial. And I'd much rather see that than Man City, Arsenal, Spurs or what have you. So, uh, yeah, give us what we've got and uh, hopefully we can do it. As people in the comments are saying, Thames, it's seven days since uh, we were hit with that points deduction. We've got seven days to appeal. I've not seen anything publicly or heard anything other than Forrest were mulling it over. Uh, John in the comments saying we better appeal. I'm kind of completely the opposite now. If there's any chance it, it gets increased back to six points and we lose those two in mitigation, what are you? Are, are you a gambling man? Would you push an appeal or not? I am a gambling man, not daft thousand to one, twelve leg ackers like Greg Mitchell though. More a sensible home win, um, which is what I'm what I'm betting on when Forest play Palace at the weekend. I think let it lie now. I think the a lot of work has gone into the submission. It was a very rigorous defence. I did geek out a little bit and read most of the, the, the ruling and the way that Forrest articulated their case seemed extremely comprehensive. They were credited for leaning into it. They were credited for throwing the door open for the manner in which they interacted with, with the panel and that would have played into the, the mitigation. So feels to me like it could have been a lot worse. The statement was extremely um, well, well written and as all clubs do, they, they they played the PR game to explain why they found themselves in that position. But uh, as a fan, and I think also putting my shoes, putting myself in the shoes of people sat in the office, office at Forest, they've had a reasonably good outcome there. They've got a clear focus on what we need to do between now and the end of the season. And forgetting the extended run of fixtures, those two games in four days against Palace and Fulham, 
could negate the effect of the points that have been taken away from us. That's that's my only focus now. Get to the next Wednesday morning in a far better position than we find ourselves now. Forget about the points thing. They'll be shoot out against Luton side who are low on confidence and have a far tougher run than we do. What do you think the players would want from their point of view, Lewis? I mean, we don't know the group specifically, but would you rather know, OK, we're one point inside the relegation zone, this is it, or would you rather have that kind of carrot of a potential uh, appeal and a, a positive result in your favour or not? I think I think the biggest thing along along this situation, when this has dragged out for so long, I think that's been the most frustration with all people connected with with the football club, that it's just hung over us for such a long period of time. I think that... There, there has been an answer. Whether the appeal or the situation will happen, the people in the background, the professionals will get will get involved in that and, and sort that out either way in which the club decide to go. I think the important thing now is, as Temp says, we look at it. We look at it. it could have been a lot, lot worse. Uh, and yes, OK, we never want to find ourselves in that position. No club does, but it's happened. We've got four points. And I think in the grand scheme of it, four points is not really doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of really where we was in the league so i think that the, the most important thing now is to from a playing side and a, and a football inside is to is to put that to bed it's happened there's been a decision been made and it's now to focus on uh getting good performances good results and i think listen we all want good good performances the manager will want that and the players will want that but I think first and foremost, from now to the end of the season, it's about it's about getting points, and we need points on the board. And I don't think any Nottingham Forest fan will sit here at the end of the season. And if we've got the the right points to stay in this league, okay, performances quite haven't been up to scratch. I think we'll take it and we'll dust ourselves down. Nuno give Nuno a chance to have a good summer, shape everything a little bit more, ins and outs, and then we start again next season in the Premier League. But I think. First and foremost, right now, the most important thing is to get points on the board and, and let the, the other the outside noise take care of itself. Um, we'll discuss the Palace game a lot more through the week as we progress, but I spoke to... <coughs> uh, I've had a busy morning. I've recorded th- two podcasts already. One of them was with a Palace fan to get their take. Um, and they, Greg, feel like it's terrible timing to play us because of the points deduction. They think Forrest are going to come out firing and uh, you know be eager to... To get these points back, do you think that happens with this group or not? From what we've seen, that's how I'd look at it as well. If I was an away fan, thinking they're going to be like annoyed now, they're going to be going for it, and uh, yeah, I can understand his view on that. That's exactly how I'd be. And I think Everton's is April eighth, isn't it, or something like that? So we'll be playing them shortly after that, and I'm sure I'll be, I'll be feeling that then. Um, but yeah, let's hope. So. <laughs> Let's hope we do. We haven't really shown it yet, have we? I keep saying it in previous games that we're going to be angry and we're going to try and prove a point. It hasn't really materialised yet, but two weeks out of it and, you know, uh, they'll all be back together by Wednesday, I think, won't they? So a few days to get ready and hopefully they've got to. They've got to start doing it soon. Uh, like I say, we'll, we'll discuss Palace a lot more through the week. There's a lot of other stuff to talk about around uh, transfer interest in players and how PSR relates to it. Um, Murillo and Gibbs White seems to be the main one. John Percy in the Telegraph saying, you know, Forrest won't accept less than 50 million for each of them. What do you think about the, the prospects of keeping one or both temps? Are you, are you fearful that we're going to have to let at least one of them go with the realities of PSR? Yes, sadly we will. I think to get to a, a point where we're going to drive significant profit from from a player. They're, they're the two that will be talked about in that kind of price bracket. I actually think Murillo is the more likely sale. Uh, a, because it's just a slightly lower age profile. His, his potential is huge. I think he's a future international for sure and a Champions League centre-half in the, in, the, in the making. But we, we bought him for a song. So the, the profitability on that is, is huge. Morgan Gibbs White. Let's not remember we we probably paid above market value for the player he was then, and he's kicked on. I just feel with Morgan Gibbs White, his next move is not going to be his final move. He's not going to go straight to the top six. He could find himself playing ten for you know, the traditional top six. He could find himself playing ten for a West Ham, a Villa, someone of that ilk. I think. I just don't perceive that Arsenal, certainly not Man City or Chelsea, 
are, are ready to to plump for him. I think he just he just needs one of those middle ranking sides before he kicks on, and that their finance is a little bit more restricted. So Murillo is the the more likely sale uh, for me. We've lauded him from the from the get go, haven't we? And you can see why top top European clubs would want to get him into their ranks. And just back onto the distraction thing for a sec. I know. Greg, as he likes to, frames that into a massive positive and a reason why Forrest is going to go out and smash Palace by four or five. But I'm always interested when we stick these questions to Lewis and any pro, any form of pro, and they'll generally say, it doesn't affect us. It's outside noise. We're, we're there to play football. What's gone before, what's going on in the future makes very little difference. I think we need to give footballers credit for that. They don't read every preview. They don't listen to us spieling on. They turn up on a, on a Saturday afternoon and deploy their skills to try and win a game of football. We've all heard stories about lads missing the birth of their kids or being overseas without their family or, or whatever it might be. They do have an ability to block that out and just focus on the game in hand. And I think us as fans perhaps get a bit overly emotional about what does this mean, what does that mean? I'm sure Lewis will back this up. They're just there to win a game of football and they're part of not even the 1%, they're part of the 0.01% that have made it to a level where that's pretty much all they have to think about for 10 years of their lives. Is that true, Lewis? I'm sure Billy Davis would have fined you two weeks' wages if you read anything in the media. But can you can you shut out the noise as players? I, I think it, it it becomes a it becomes a, a really good trait to have when you when you play at a, a, a top level in any sport. Really, I think I think it's part it's part of the 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 kind of remit that you have to have. I think there's so many so much outside noise, even more so now with social media. That every day there's there's different kind of news, there's different outlets, there's different stories. I think if you can, some, if you kind of get sucked in and, and, and focus on them, it, it can swallow you up. So I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's a real big kind of uh, a plus and a positive to have in your armour, really, to understand that we probably play most weekends and, and most weekends by sometimes home fans, definitely away fans, that we get we get abused a lot. It's just part and part. So you become over time, you're so thick skinned and these stories what are happening. Is it affecting them players at this point in time? Day to day? No. They've still got a, a job to do and their job is to go and perform on match days and win points for this football club. And, and, and that's what they have to do. And at this point in time, them things aren't really affecting that change room. Yes, it'll be it'll be outside and it'll be spoken about, of course. That's that's reality. But in terms of does it affect them straight away right as this minute? No, they've still got to go and play and, and go and earn points for this football club and hopefully keep them in the in the, in the Premier League. From a Forest point of view specifically with this team, Lewis, if you had to lose Gibbs White or Murillo, like I agree with Tampson, Murillo's got a massive ceiling, but is it kind of easier to lose Murillo and try and get a functional centre-half and not replace Gibbs White in that number 10 position? Is it... If you had to choose one to lose from a specific team, which one would you be picking? Yeah, I, I think it, I think it's hard, and I think it's also kind of wrong to kind of whatever to pick one. I think both of them have a massive input uh, on this team and on this on this football club, and and ideally you, you wouldn't want to lose either of them. Uh, it, it's starting to become a common theme that these football clubs at the at the bottom of the league are are getting kind of have to get handpicked. From the teams at the top, from the, from their best players, and and that's obviously a, a conversation for another day. But hopefully, you wouldn't want to wouldn't want to lose either of them. And I think both of them, with with their own individual aspects, bring a bring a lot to the team in in very different ways. Well, I suppose, Greg, one thing that uh, was intimated in the press that they can do to avoid it is they've got a lot of players out of contract. They release pretty much all of them. I mean, you could there's a way around if you extend Chris Wood's contract by a year, you actually help yourself with FFP, uh, and then you try and have a bit of a fire sale of the fringe players. Is that realistic? Do you think we can get buyers for Dennis and um, I'm trying to think of who, who those other players are, players out on loan, basically, who haven't really featured. Can we do that to mitigate FFP? Uh, we're certainly not going to make a, a huge amount to be able to sign more players. It's all right breaking even, but we still need to strengthen, don't we? And I think selling a big player will help us strengthen in other areas, hopefully find the next Murillo again. Um, Dennis, realistically, Saudi league or somewhere like that to get us some kind of money, because if not, he's going to be a promoted team or a, a top-end championship side for me. 
Um, I keep seeing Omar Richardson players like that being mentioned. They've they've not done anything to to give themselves any type of of uh, fee, have they? Really? So no, I think the only way really is to obviously use the the Mangala money and then hopefully, sadly, make big money on one player. Yeah, I hope the Mangala money doesn't become the Chris Gunter money. But yeah, I know, I think you're right. And I suppose, Temps, people mentioning Lewis O'Brien as well. It probably shows like we can't be wasteful in the market anymore with the way every club's finding this uh, of our size. You have to be good in the transfer market or you're going to run into trouble pretty quickly now, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Well, it was a big reprofiling of the age thing at Forest, wasn't there, on, on, on Dave Murphy's watch, where we did start to sign lads who would have resale value, hopefully could come on a journey with us and kick on. But if you're not playing 30, 40, 50 games, you're not being looked at and, and you, you're quickly lost in that system. Your value goes down. Lewis O'Brien, great example, plays the first game against Newcastle away. Forest decide quite quickly that he's, he's not right for the level. They recruit three or four additional central midfielders. And all of a sudden, his video footage is being viewed in the context of DC United rather than the, the Premier League. So his value doesn't necessarily kick on. I think we made a slim margin on Sam Surridge, maybe paid three million, sold him for five million quid because he was a bit part player. He, he was doing OK with the minutes that he, that he had. But we, we made mistakes, a lot of high profile mistakes, a, a high volume of players through, through the door. And there's a very, very small number. Mangala and Johnson are two standouts of, of lads whose value kicked on and we cashed in the right time. What are our keepers worth now? How are you going to get Matt Turner and Odysseus Vlokodimos off the, off the books without a significant loss? There are, there are several um, players in the squad. And I, I say I'm going to be accused of being a LinkedIn clown again with one of the phrases I'm about to use. But are, are they an asset or are they a liability in a financial sense? They're going to cost more to get rid of than they, they they're going to um, than we're, we're ever going to make. We can't justify playing Odysseus what we're paying him to be a third choice keeper. I think it was a reputed forty five grand a week um, wedge that he's getting from the from the club, and he's he's absolutely nowhere near the team. So yeah, a lot of work to do. I don't envy those um, members of staff in the football department that have to ship some of these lads on because for every Murillo. There are six or seven that are just far, far harder to chuck out the door. I heard most of that. My daughter's now texting me from downstairs saying that the food I've left out for her lunch is warm and basically unacceptable. So she'll have to look after herself a bit longer. Sorry, but yeah, kids. Uh, right. Moving away from uh, those two lads and transfers in general, Willie Bolly went off injured for Ivory Coast. Oh, Greg, are we cursed? I don't know what's going on. It feels like, well, he's a bit injury prone, isn't he? But there's always something, isn't there, in these international breaks? It's the classic international break curse, yeah. Especially centre-backs. We get one going and get a real good run out of one and then off the go and not to be seen for a few weeks again. Hopefully it's just a knock. It may well be, but I'd be gutted if we uh, can't play him. But luckily we've got others that have now returned to fitness ready to take his spot. I know that that is true, Lewis. We have got other players ready to come in, but I see um, one of our members, Paul Morley, said we've used fourteen different pairings of centre backs, goalkeepers combined this season. I mean, that's not a recipe for success, is it? Yeah, no, it's not really a blueprint that you want to kind of uh, kind of carry on with. Yeah, it's it's not ideal, uh, but it, but again, I think if you, if you look at that stat and if you look where we are in the league, there's there's, there's probably no surprise you you. You try and get any team you want your spine to be as consistent uh, as possible. I think if you if you go back to our championship season uh, and the success we had, if you look at the spine, it was very much quite. Every, most games, it, it it was pretty much spot on, uh, and I think that's all you try and do at any team. You want to create that spine, and hopefully they're they're, they're very consistent, and they're going to be kind of out on the pitch uh, as much as possible. Sometimes that unfortunately doesn't happen, and there's a lot of stuff that can that can affect that. But I think that high number of of different partnerships and different goalkeeper I, I, it doesn't bode well for for anyone involved. And 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 I think that will be a big thing moving forward. Whatever the partnership will be, is just trying to get a bit of stability and a bit of kind of consistency in that in in that back area. 
I mean, I hope he's fit for the weekend temps because I think he'd be in my team to mark um, Mateta, the big guy up front for Palace. But going forwards, I see Greg Orham in the comments saying, you know, for, I mean, Forrest is continuing off from a deal. Can you really do that with Bolly? He's He seems to be fit for five games and injured for five a lot of the time he's been here. Is it a reluctant one you have to let him go now? We keep coming back to calling for him in certain situations, don't we? Wanting him in the team knowing his best qualities, accepting too that for a 20-minute rearguard action, when you're preserving something, he's the man for that job. So the reason I'd offer him terms is because he, he profiles different and offers something different to the other players. A bit more of an old-fashioned defender, no great shakes on the ball, but he's comfortable enough, wins his headers and his tackles, doesn't mind a physical battle with a, with a big lad like, like, like Mateta and one or two others that you're going to come up against in the Premier League. So he'd get an offer from me. It'd be an extra year in a window where we're probably going to see, uh, potentially going to see Joe Worrell move on. We're definitely going to see Felipe retire. McKenna's already gone. You don't want to get to a point where you have to recruit two and three, do you? We've just, just spoken about the relatively high likelihood of, of Murillo being tempted elsewhere. So from where I'm sat, albeit in the stands, with, with no understanding of his mindset or his uh, the options that he has to him i'd be offering willie bolly a one-year extension do you think there's still room for that kind of player in a team lewis because even if you look at the top size like diaz at city van dyke's obviously way better than but he is physical and even you know harry Maguire at united romero at spurs you do still need that head it and kick it kind of profile defender don't you even if you have better ones the higher up the ladder you go yeah, of course. I think I think that's the, the 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 crazy thing about football now is that there's so many people uh, trying to complicate it and overcomplicate it and make it what it's not. It doesn't matter what level you play at. Football is very simple. It won't change. It will never change. And defenders need to defend. Strikers need to put the ball in the back of the net. It, it doesn't change. And and it's just you you never not need them kind of players. And and I think sometimes people the there's, there's new waves and new trends about we need this ball playing centre half, you need all this. And sometimes you can get all lost in that. And this is just a reality of the world we 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 currently are in when it when it comes to football. But at the end of the day, you have defenders first and foremost. They need to defend, defend the box, defend the area. The rest, hopefully, if they've got that bonus, but first and foremost, they've got to defend. And I think when balls come into the box, when you're kind of a, a, a team that's maybe at the the bottom part of the uh, of the league you have to understand that a lot of the time you're probably going to come under come under the caution if you're holding on to games that you're going to be under severe pressure so i think players like that to have in the squad uh, i think it's i think it's definitely a plus uh that that you, that you can call upon someone like that at some point the other one who might stay greg looks like being olorena i mean is that a no-brainer uh, i know he's had injuries but he's a lot younger and the kind of thing is probably more of would you be, you know, start straight away in Aina's case? Yeah, definitely. He's shown enough to be able to want to sign him. Uh, he's had a big injury, but all players will through the career, won't they? So I wouldn't hold that one against him. I don't think he's necessarily injury prone. But yeah, he, he's one of our best players in that position. So you certainly give him a an extension if, it, if it's right for us, of course. Um, sticking on fullbacks, kind of going through the team a bit here. Nico's goal for Wales for uh, indirect from a free kick. Everyone's saying, right, get him on free kicks. Uh, what do you think about that, Lewis, as a guy who took free kicks for Forrest? Are you taking them off Gibbs White now and sticking Nico on everything? Well, uh, from from the funny side, he'll be coming back in into the training this week, and he'll be giving he'll be giving a little bit more. You're not you're not seeing my free kick. You're not. He'll be uh, he'll be waiting for for kind of. To, to have a look. But listen, that's I think that's a positive for the football club for himself. I think we, we spoke about him briefly before. I think he's been he's been really, really solid and his performances have been really good. And obviously he's took that into the international week. He's got a really good goal uh in, in a game. So that's that that's a positive for him to come back into the football club in a in a good frame of mind, good attitude. And listen, we never know. Uh, there's an opportunity comes comes on Saturday. He he might be uh, he might be on the shoulders of, of Gibbs White. That's for sure. Mate, hey, Lewis has scored Lewis has scored five free kicks a game against Finland. He's not impressed by that. <laughs> I don't know about that. He's very good free kick taker. But yeah, hey, what? Yeah, fair play to Nico. What do you think about Morgan taking the free kicks, Lewis, as the number ten? You played that role. Do you kind of feel like right? 
I, I'm the creative spark. I should be on free kicks because I'm the number 10, even if I'm not necessarily the best free kick taker. Does that enter into the thoughts with Morgan or not? Uh, I think it's I think it's a discussion that they've got to have in the training ground and, ar and around the squad with the management and the players. For me, uh, I think that throughout my career, sometimes you have a lot of players that think they can take free kicks and want to take free kicks, but it's not it's not that simple. I it, it's a I, I feel it's a real a big point. Every time you get a free kick, especially 20, 25 yards out, it's a real good opportunity to score. And that's how I look at set pieces. And I, I, I think that you have to look at that. You have to, through training and, and, and through and through watching players, you have to decide that who's the best free kick taker. Because I think every opportunity to get a free kick at 25 yards from goal, it's a great opportunity to score. That's how I see it. I always used to look at it as if, if I had a free kick 25 yards or in, if I got it on target, it was a goal. That's that's the way I looked at free kick. That's the It was that point of that, not I'm going to miss, it's he's got to save it. So I think it's a real big kind of thing to look at. People look at set pieces, make so much bigger set pieces of, they're bringing in coaches now just for set pieces and stuff like that. So free kicks are, are no different. I, I feel that sometimes it's, it's, it's more in hope Players now, you see players have three kicks in hope, and but it shouldn't be like that. It's it's a real, real uh, good opportunity to to score a goal. Are you elbowing players out of the way at Forest to say that I'm taking this because who would else would they be? I mean, Raddy, uh, probably Nicky Shaw. He took a good free kick. Were you saying right, this is mine, get out of the way when it was your to turn? Be fair, to be fair, they didn't. No, they didn't really. They didn't really. Cook. To be fair, Raddy, me and Raddy sometimes shared, and Reedy. And obviously, Reedy was the left hand side, so sometimes it was it, it was a better kind of angle for him. And like I said, that's that's fine. You have we at times I've played with Reedy and Raddy, a really good free kick takers. So uh, you 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 look at that and and you don't mind maybe having keeping the goalkeeper guessing. It's when the ones kind of took one free kick in training six months ago, and all of a sudden think, yeah, you know what, I'm going to take a free kick and start trying to. Trying to get in the way. That's when the problems are because, like I said, it's it's a it's a great opportunity, and you might only get one good opportunity a game. So, uh, no, I think it's something that that they'll look at. Uh, I think that uh, Gibbs White is, is has been on them, and I think he's got the technical quality. But like I said, I think it's a uh, maybe with uh, with Nico's goal, he'll be he'll be kind of knocking on the door. That's for sure. You throwing elbows for Hucknall Vets attempts to be on the set pieces still? Oh, mate. I mean, all my Twitter followers know that I've, I've been stanching free kicks for years, albeit at a very different level to uh, to, to Lewis McGugan. Thanks for the opportunity to repost a few later, actually, Matt. Really grateful for that. But the point I was making about the Finnish goalkeeper is he's not Peter Schmeichel, is he? And, you know, if you, if you watch the videos of me banging a few in in the uh, South Wales League, these kids are five foot two that are studying goal and are barely moving. Lewis in the in the championship is coming up against six foot seven professional keepers and used to stanch it on the on the regular. And I think the lads know they're in a group of footballers at Sunday morning dog and duck level like me or the championship. The lads know who's going to give them the best possible chance of scoring from any given situation. I think there probably are times, mate, and you'll back me up on this, where seniority within the dressing room might be a thing. So you coming through as a 19-year-old kid, albeit one with a reputation for being able to do it from 25 yards, some gnarly old 30-year-old pro is not going to have too much respect for that until they've seen it themselves. So you have to establish yourself. But once, you, once you've done that two or three times, get the right man on it, leave them on it, back them, trust them. What I want to see from Morgan Gibbs-White is same as everybody else, more goals. Because for all his technical ability and the amount of ball we give him in and around the box, he doesn't translate that into being a regular scorer. Incredible feat. The way he changes direction, able to beat a man one-on-one, -on -one, shifts the ball left foot, right foot, and, and the vision absolutely there for the pass, for the cross for Chris Wood's goal um, last week, some of the passes that he plays. I don't think he's arrived at that. Um, kind of Lampard in his pomp facet, Gerard in, in, in his pomp of being a reliable 15-20 goal a season man. Far, far from it. Part of that's because he's a, he's a bit um, selfless. I think he's one of those players potentially values the assist more than the goal, you tell me. But he's no time soon is he going to be a 10-15 goal man unless he, he really improves that 
finishing that selfishness and that instinct to, to find half a yard and smash it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting speaking to opposition fans, the previews, and again for the Palace game, who are you worried about? Morgan gives white he's the one who makes things happen, and he does, but he does, if you look at his numbers, he does need to add that to his game to to go to the next level, I think, hopefully with Forrest, but I think that's certainly fair for sure. The other player who shan't in the international break uh, so far is Gio Reyna, so I'll let Greg talk about him because two assists against Jamaica, goal against Mexico and play of the tournament in the CONCACAF Nations League, uh, whatever that is, I don't really know, but you know, it, it can't hurt to win play of the tournament in any level. Do we, should, we have to get him minutes off the bench at least now, Greg, don't we, depending on the game situation? Yeah, and all the talk of his bad attitude was when he's away with the USA. So if that's a bad attitude, then absolutely. Uh, it, he's not going to be starting against Palace, is he, in case this, unless there's some huge injuries, injury blows. But, you know, get him on, change a game. Let's just see a bit of him, especially if the game's going in the right direction for us. Uh, but yeah, he's done himself no harm at all against Jamaica and a good Mexico team. So uh, fair play to him. And hopefully it's a a start for the remainder of the season for him. I really hope so. Yeah, they were good assists uh, and a good goal, to be fair. Uh, quick thanks to uh, Robbo, who's a genius for signing up as a channel member. Appreciate the support. And Danny Tring as well, I noticed, signed up as well. Thanks very much for that, chaps. Um, the other area of the team, I mean, it doesn't change with Rain at Lewis. It's always uh, gives White at 10. But behind them, it's like a revolving cast of Dominguez, um, Danilo, Sangare back in the mix now. And Ryan Yates, we saw a different combination at Luton. Just what's your take on that, the best two for you? Uh, is it nailed? Is it match by match? Do you want to see some consistency into these final nine, get nine games in that central midfield area now? Yeah, I think, this, I think you always want to see uh, consistency in any team. But I think, again... It's back to kind of the similar conversation we was talking about the centre centre halves and, and the goalkeeper. I think that that's why we probably find ourselves where we are. I think that any manager will want consistency, but clearly he, he he just can't find it or can't really make up his mind at the minute. I, I think that there's a constant change in there, and I think it just doesn't bode well for everyone around the team. I think every single player that plays the game has to want to build confidence and want to kind of build uh, a, a kind of a kind of run into the team and it's really difficult to 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 be to perform when you're coming in and out of the team and you've, you're in and then you're out for a couple of games and you're back in it, it it's really hard to get that momentum so uh, listen I think that the the sooner the team gets a bit more uh solid uh and a bit more consistent I think that hopefully partnerships can 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 start to start to form but again we're sitting here with uh pretty much near the end of the season still talking about hopefully partnerships are going to form and this combination that combination so i think that's in in the bigger picture probably why we find ourselves where we are and i think that 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 that's a that can come down to a lot of things in terms of the different managers in terms of the a lot of personnel in and out and and a lot of signings that probably haven't worked but I think we've just got to probably the manager's got to probably go with what he feels is the the most solid and, and consistent performers from now. And, and like I said at the start of the show, it's about getting points on the board now. And yes, with that we want to we want to put out good performances, but 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 we need points on the board. And and hopefully, the manager's got to look at the team that he trusts the most and, the, and are going to be the most solid and give us the best opportunity to to grind out wins. Um, just before we expand on that, a quick word for our sponsors. As ever, the Trent Navigation, this is related to Trent Bridge, actually, Temps. Uh, if you enter the uh, FPL League, you can win two tickets to a T20 game at Trent Bridge. This summer, league code is LY4UG8. That's lowercase, LY4UG8. Uh, I've entered myself, although I don't expect to win, but we shall see. Uh, and also, just quickly, before Temps comes in and says something to promote his cricket, I've just got to promote one more thing. <laughs> Uh, in the uh, Oasis and gig, uh, Saturday the 13th of April, 5.30, straight after Forest v Wolves at the City Ground. As ever, free entry, you can get your food post-match in the barbecue, food court and bars inside and out. So no doubt that will be a good evening uh, to uh, round off the day at the match. Did you want to say something about cricket there, Thames? I don't know where he's getting his tickets from. I, think, uh, I don't <laughs> remember signing that one off. So yeah, 
uh, the NAV clearly have a far more developed commercial strategy than me because they're, they're getting all of my tickets without me knowing about it. <laughs> uh, going back to the forest midfield, Lewis, and I'll pick the other lads' brains on it as well. But the other thing I've not, not already asked about is if there's this unsettled pairing in central midfield, does that have a knock-on effect on the centre-halves, not knowing who's going to be in front of them where during a match? Does it impact the number 10? not knowing where he might receive the ball off a player in midfield. Again, does that kind of lack of consistency spread, do you think? Yeah, I think I think, I think think that's just common in, in, in kind of any kind of team structure, really. I think the whole point about a team structure is, is trying to create partnerships uh, and relationships and, 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 and confidence within each other and hopefully to get to the point where you can kind of, before it's happening, know what certain players are doing and that's maybe the fullback and, and, and the wide man get a partnership and the midfielder partner is centre off and the goalkeeper and it just it just brings confidence and a bit of stability. Uh so I, I think all over the pitch when there's probably a lot of changes, uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't help. It, it it doesn't help because you when you're playing at that top level, the the small margins are 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 that small that sometimes, you know what I mean, when you when you maybe you need your friend or you need your partner. You need to be able to have that little kind of two, three seconds prior to know what they're probably going to do or know how they're going to spin in behind and all, all these things. But I think partnerships, especially down that spine, goalkeeper, centre-half, centre-midfield, I think you, you, you continue to have a real good, solid, consistent partnership in them areas. I think around that, you can then kind of flow and, and mix it up at certain times. But I think down the middle of the pitch, you constantly need that consistency and spine which are going to provide that kind of foundation for the rest of the team uh to allow them to go and fulfill their their attacking opportunities so opening up the age-old debate which which features name ryan yates i'm sure people have an opinion but greg if you were picking a consistent two now for these get runner games is danilo in there is yates in there is it sangari and dominguez putting you on the spot I don't think Sangari and Yates. I don't think that one worked, but I'd still pick Yates over Sangare. Uh And yeah, Danilo seems to have had the minutes maybe ahead of Dominguez, but it is it, they're four very form-wise. They're, they're all very similar at the minute. None of them are actually, you know, cementing their spot. So I couldn't really pick. I'd, I'd have Yates as the starter of out of all of them, put it that way. So you you now got fifty percent of the comments saying yes and fifty yeah, percent yeah I know it's always the same well they say I'm a moron <laughs> anyway that was before that what about you uh, attempts uh, it's interesting Greg's right I think we're not picking from a position of power or form particularly for any of them probably I always come down on the attacking side of these debates so where there's such a narrow decision to be made by four players. Um, who have very very different benefits? I'm going to make a little case for Danilo being one of the, one of the the two because he just offers that bit more going forward. I think he's more adept at turning defence into attack quickly, either through progressive carries or he's got a, a passing range which I don't really see in the in the others' games. I think he can find a Langer Hudson Odoi earlier in the in the moves, which is the manner in which we 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 score our goals. So I'm going to pair Danilo with. Ryan Yates for Palace. Okay, so I'm sure people in the comments will have a, a different answer. I could say to you, uh, oh, Danilo's the best on the ball, but he's so inconsistent, and then you can make arguments for all of them. So what about you, Lewis? Are there two that you favour or not right now? Uh, I, th- I think it's tough. I think I think, I think the, the, the main one is, is when you look at the manager and probably... If you look at what he's done currently, I think I think Yatesy kind of pips a lot of him. When you're in them tough situations, especially as a manager, when you're kind of backs against the wall and you, and you need to go out there, first and foremost, you need players that you, you're going to know exactly what you're going to get and you can trust what the performance you're going to get. We all know exactly what, what Yatesy brings to the team. Uh, yes, is he going to probably jump around three players and probably put it in the top corner? Maybe not, but the, the, the stuff he does off the ball... And, and and the work he does around the team, I think it's very important. So I think he's at this current time for what's needed. Uh, I think he's he's a mainstay and I think it's one more to add him. I don't quite know if him and Sangara together works. Uh, I, I, I just don't know 
kind of how that possibly works. I do like Danilo. I, I, I've got I've got a lot of time for what he tries to bring. Yes, I think he can be frustrating, but I also think them players that can change a game or do something are always frustrating at times. And I think that when you have the likes of Yates that you're gonna you're gonna have and you're gonna commit in there. You know what you're going to get from him, but you, you you still need that little bit of quality in and around that to maybe to maybe change game up on its head. And I and I think Danilo's got that. So I'd probably say uh, Danilo and Yates for me at this point in time. Interesting. I think yeah, Danilo's the one who's best at popping it into Gibbs White on the on the turn and getting us up the pitch through lines. So. I can I can see a case for all of them. Did you want to come in there, Temps? Do you trust Sangare, Temps? No, because because I haven't seen him be what he's promised to be for us yet. I, I, I really, really want him to fulfil his potential and to be the player he was at PSV. Because if he did that, there'd be no debate. We'd be picking him as the, the first, first of the two and discussing who's alongside him. What I've seen from the stands is... A player who's inconsistent has been in and out. Yes, has been disrupted by Afcon, but has, has taken the the safe option when he's when he's been on the ball a little bit too often for me. So that's that's why I, I can't even bring myself to bag him because I was a, a, as excited as anybody when we signed him. He felt like the big statement piece of the summer and the player that was going to help us to 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 kick on. But Yates, he keeps coming back again, again, and again. Carvalho covers out of nowhere. Does five consecutive Cruyff turns in training. Yates, he comes through, wipes him out, and the gaffer's like, that's my boy. And I can just imagine that happening time and time again. Time and time again. Ryan Yates trains well, does the basics well, consistent, finds his man, does the extra after training, does his prehab, fills his forms in, whatever he needs to do, eats well. And Lewis said it, you, you don't need a team full of mavericks who might turn it on one game in three. You need solid, dependable, reliable um, players like Ryan Yates to 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 be uh, to carry out your instructions on the on the pitch, on 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 form and history and everything else. It, it'd be the opposite of that, wouldn't it? You pick Dominguez and Sangare, two experienced international footballers who've done it all around Europe. And here's us making a case for a Brazilian we hadn't heard of until two years ago, and a lad that's come up for our academy and has truly never been the star of the team and finds himself the last man standing from the playoff run. So, yeah, that's that's football. It's not enough just to be just to be great. You have to apply it consistently as well. And that's why Yacy keeps getting the nod. Mm, yeah, I think Sangare is one maybe we have to reset in the summer and, you know, get a pre-season out of him and have a better look. Well, I shouldn't be saying that out for a £35 million signing, but, you know, I probably am <laughs> at the moment. I trust Ryan Yates to... To, to play because you know what you're going to get from him I would say certainly so, yeah moving on to forwards um, Chris Wood looks like he'll be fit which is great Ribeiro Rodrigo Ribeiro's had a really good international break with Portugal under 19s but I suppose Greg it's a big leap from Portugal under 19 to start in Premier League game so the fact Chris Wood looks like he's going to be fit feels pretty massive for us now doesn't it going to this Palace game yeah he needs to be fit and we did think he was anyway by the noises that were coming out so great news if so perfect against Palace um but it's nice to have another option and we may well have to call on him just because of the lack of other strikers on the bench or ready to ready to start a game it's certainly not going to be Taiwo for a few weeks so you know get a chance and take it and it may well may well come off because he might be the only option for us I mean, is Chris Wood central now to us staying up, Lewis? Because Tywo is probably going to be back for at best three games at the end, something like that. And even then, can you rely on him? It feels like a lot comes on, is resting on Chris Wood's shoulders now. Yeah, and, uh, and sometimes that happens. And and probably six weeks ago, we, was, we, we, we wouldn't be sitting here thinking that Chris Wood is, is, is probably going to be that that vital in terms of spearheading our, our attack. But that's football. It happens, and I think if you look at it, he scored goals, and and, he's, and he and he will score goals if he gets the right kind of ammunition and and a bit more now over the time. I think when he first started, it, it was kind of didn't really know what he bring in terms of the team was to helping him bring the best out of him. Uh, and I think over time, the, the the kind of the match between the team and the players and himself. I've got a bit more closer where there's an understanding of, of of what's the best way to get 
to get the best things out of him. And I, and I think that we've just got to be in that positive outlook at it. And he's the man at this current point that is 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 probably gonna probably gonna lead the attack. And and we've just got to be fully confident that that he can maybe hopefully score the goals to 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 get them points to keep us in the league. But I but I definitely think with with Tywer being out, which which I'm I'm not surprised. And I did say when we spoke post Liverpool, uh there was just a lot of red flags in terms of in terms of kind of how he looked. And then since then he 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 hasn't really been involved in and now he's out. So I think it's that importance now to look at Chris Wood. Arig is obviously helping and, and getting better by the week. And hopefully now he can start chipping in uh with goals which is needed. And I think we said about with with Morgan Gibbs White, I think that he has to start he has to start scoring goals now. I think that's that last little piece now to to really kind of finish where he needs to be. I think I think he's got so much potential, so much quality. But I think when you're in them areas, when you're in that that number 10 role, uh you have to share a workload on on the goal front. And uh so that'll be a big thing now and along with Alanga and Hudson Adore. So I think we've got a collective unit in the sense of all need to start chipping in. Can't we just sit here and say right it's all on Chris Wood, it's all on Chris Wood. He needs to score all the goals. I think we've got that that attacking balance that they all need to provide goals and assists and, and hopefully collectively they can they can come together to get us over the line. Do you think it's a question of trust as well, Temps? I know Lewis has been on here before and said, you know, managers have that 14 to 18 players they really trust. And it feels like Wood's in that that bracket more than Tyway for, for Nuno. He seems like he leans on him a fair bit. And it's probably why he's not blooding those mid-season loan players either, because what are you going to get out of Gearena? Well, nothing unless you trust him. But you've got to accept that he might have a, a a period of bad form, a game where he's slightly off the pace if he's not used to his not used to his teammates. So odd signing, but summed up around that situation we're in now. We haven't got a nine-point cushion to the bottom three and able to experiment and have half an eye on next year. We need results now. I, I dare say to a point, Nuno's job requires him to have points in the next four or five games that that change our change our situation. So it's not really a time for a manager to experiment and he'll place a premium on trust rather than try things that may or may not come off. So yeah, it's it's an absolute must. It's the reason why he now trusts this goalkeeper. He'll play every game between now and the end of the season. It's it's the reason why he's narrowed down his selection to a to a core group. I hope he places a bit more trust in Callum Hudson Odoi, if that's all it's going to take, rather than it being any kind of recovery from injury. But uh, I, I don't see um, Gio Reyna getting much of an opportunity for this point, just because he does remain unproven in the Premier League. Right. Uh, I've just covered all the ground I wanted to cover today. Just before we move on to any other business, uh, I'll just run through this week's schedule. We've got um, Palace Opposition View uh, tomorrow. Got a good interview I've recorded uh, for Wednesday, then the full Palace preview uh, with our guys on Thursday and an evening Q&A on Friday before the post-match show on Saturday. Uh, just before we go into any other business, a quick word for our other sponsors, uh, Brood Backer. I have really, oh, there you go. I clicked on the button. It's right in front of me. That's a stroke of good luck because I was terribly unprepared for that. Uh, link in the description as ever, but uh, owned by Forest Season Ticket Holder, Danny Baker. Thanks for his support. Uh, if you've got any issues around noise issues with your business, then they are the people for you. Right. Any other business, Greg Mitchell? Always. Um, the Mall 2024 Cup at Rushcliffe Golf Club, 2nd of June. A uh, book via. Uh, Is this where you try and recruit Lewis before? <laughs> I was getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> and Temps. He'll be there anyway. Uh, Mall2024.co.uk, four balls, live music after on the terrace. If you've ever been to Rushcliffe Golf Club, one of the best views of Nottinghamshire. Uh, and it's just going to be a great day. At food at night, a bit of music. It'll just be a laugh. And it's for some good causes as well. So, uh, yeah, mall2024.co.uk. That's it for me. Nothing like super noodles. I see you've had about 30 oh, no. I don't, super know, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I, have you found out where they're from? Well, the first load were from uh, Laura and her sister, but then someone else has got me address and now kindly keeps uh, sending super noodles through the post. So uh, I do appreciate it. They'll be going to a, a food bank, a local food bank, of course. But uh, yeah, Laura 
stole a pack of my super noodles and I may have got a little bit mardy and it's uh, come back to bite me like always. <laughs> like always. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if Super Noodles want to sponsor this podcast, reach out. By the way, thanks <laughs> anything from you. Greg's told me the real reason. So he eats nothing but Super Noodles. And if you want a body like Greg, you should too. That's breakfast, <laughs> lunch, and dinner. So yeah, that's what's happening there. He's the poster boy for them. I think he's actually. Am I right in saying you've rested your laptop on them for this? <laughs> For what you're doing now? <laughs> not happy. Like yeah. Alan Partridge with Toblerones, <laughs> Greg Mitchell cannot function without a super noodle. So I've got nothing to promote other than to endorse Greg's charitable causes, the work he's doing for Stephen Mullaney, who's a real good mate at the cricket club and deserves his um, his testimonial. So yeah, if if you want to help in any any way, shape, or form, just send Greg another crate of super noodles, and that's <laughs> the fuel he needs to keep doing all, all this amazing work. <laughs> Lewis, anything from you before we go? No, no, nothing from me. <laughs> Good. Good, that's fine. Only thing from me is uh, the announcement for our first live show of the year. So Thursday, April the 11th at the Trent Navigation. Uh, on the panel is Fletch and Lewis. Uh, Mikey and Temps will be joining us as well. Emily's there, Pete's there. Greg's sunning himself in Spain, so he won't be there, but we'll be doing lots of them. So if you want to meet Greg Mitchell and talk about super noodles you can do come to another one throughout the summer tickets will go on sale tomorrow so i'll drop the link on twitter at forest focus pod i'll put them in video descriptions i'll drop it in this one as well so look out for tickets come to the nav thursday april 11th uh, 7 p.m start uh, and come and say hello to us so yes i think that's everything from uh, me right greg mitchell thank you very much I've got one more thing, quickly. Oh, okay. I, sp <laughs> I spent all morning having a tattoo. That's why I feel a bit rough. Uh, but my lovely tattooist was saying that uh, there was a fan of the show in her seat last week saying how much she loved the podcast. So it's, uh, wow. it's spreading to the tattoo chair as well. Greg, is it better than that one the Derby fella had done of their stadium that was on the BBC oh, News last week? <laughs> and someone brilliantly said, where's the Greg's on it? Because they'd conveniently missed out the little corner of the Greg shop. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot better. A lot more discreet as well. What is it? Oh, it's a, just a music one. Is it the text? No, no. He's got Miley Cyrus on his forearm, Matt. <laughs> I have been Taylor listening Swift to a lot of Taylor. Ass. I've been listening to a lot of Taylor Swift lately. Some good lyrics. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. Right, I forgot one as well. Really quickly, sorry. I'll drop this in the link as well. Uh, this is from Danny Train, uh, big Forest fan, and listens to the podcast. Reese Jackson at R thirty three JKO on Twitter is running the London Marathon for Great Ormond Street. So if anyone wants to donate or show Reese some support, you can do, and I'll drop that in the link. Right, we're going on. We're running over here. I'm sure everyone's got lots to do on uh, a busy day. So thanks very much for your company, everyone. Really appreciate having 400 plus with us on a Monday. Uh, as ever, do us a favor, hit like, hit subscribe. You can become a channel member and give us a lovely review on iTunes. Uh, I do enjoy reading them all. Uh, thank you very much, Michael Temple. I think we got that's as far as we got. Get the kettle on, Laura. He's coming for a super noodle. <laughs> Lewis McGugan, thank you very much. No worries, anytime. Good man, good man. Right, we'll be back uh, tomorrow with a Palace opposition preview, as I said, and then we'll see you throughout the week. But in the meantime, uh, have a good day, and we shall see you soon. <laughs>